Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To carry on with the surgical anatomy lectures, I'm going to discuss in this presentation the anatomy and mechanics of the anterior abdominal wall. I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh, professor and the head of anatomy department at Mansoura University, Egypt. In today's presentation, I'm going to cover the following points. I will talk about the muscles and aponeurosis of the anterior abdominal wall regarding their anatomy and biomechanics. And then I will describe the umbilical ring and the umbilical fascia and talk a little bit about their anatomical variations. Functionally, the anterior abdominal wall could be divided into two regions, the supraumbilical part and the infraumbilical part. The supraumbilical part is also called the parachute area because of the oblique arrangement of the muscle and aponeurotic fibers in the upper abdomen. This type of arrangement allows distensibility and expansibility of the upper abdomen and this supports the respiratory movements. If there is failure in the support of the upper abdomen, hernias develops like epigastric umbilical and paraumbilical hernias. The infraumbilical part of the abdomen is also called the pili support area. The arrangement of the muscle and the aponeurotic fibers in this region is in a downward and the medial uh, type of arrangement. Even the muscle fibers of the rectus abdominis in its lower part just approximate very closely to each other or even overlap and this will help in support the lower abdomen. Failure in the support mechanism will lead to many types of hernia like inguinal hernias, either direct or indirect, femoral hernias, and spagellian hernia. So the anterior abdominal wall is described as hexagonal area, limited above by the xiphoid process and the costal margin, below by the inguinal ligaments and the pelvic bones, and on each side by the mid-axillary lines. We can divide the anterior abdominal wall into two regions. The anterolateral region contains three flat muscles arranged one above the other in a plywood-like manner. So we have from outside to inside the external oblique, internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis muscles. The flat tendons of these muscles are called the aponeuroses, contribute to the formation of the rectus sheath, then they fuse in the midline to form the linea alba. The other region is the median region, which contains two vertically located muscles, the rectus abdominis and the small triangular pyramidalis muscle, which lies in front of the lower end of the rectus abdominis. It takes origin from the pubic bone and inserts at the linea alba to tense it. The rectus abdominis muscle is a vertically located muscle. It takes origin from the pubic bone and the symphysis pupus and then move upward towards uh, its insertion. While the two muscles move upward, they diverge from each other. Uh, and finally, it inserts at the fifth, sixth, seventh costal cartilages and also at the xiphoid process. The upper end of the rectus abdominis is broad and thin, while the lower part is much stronger, thicker, and narrower. We can also see many tendinous intersections that traverse the rectus abdominis. They are from 3 to 5 in number. They provide bending locations within the muscle to allow it to fold effectively. Otherwise, there will be excessive shortening and the punching of these muscle fibers. Also, they give transverse strength to withstand the forces applied by the lateral muscles, thus preventing the two recti from being pulled apart. Some of these tendinous intersections have special arrangement or attachment, so they laterally are attached to the vertical muscle fibers and medially at the linea alba. By this, type of arrangement, they transform the vertical force applied by the longitudinal contraction of the muscle into lateral pull for the linea alba. If there is sudden contraction of the muscle, as an increase in the intra-abdominal pressure could lead to tearing of the aponeurotic fibers in their weak point, especially if this person has a single decussation in the linea alba. The rectus sheath is one of the aponeurotic components of the anterior abdominal wall. Classically, it is described in three locations. First, superior to the costal margin, 
So in this region, the only function of the uh, anterior abdominal rule is to distend uh, during respiratory movement. So the rectus sheath here is formed as follows. Its anterior wall is made by the aponeurosis of the external oblique alone, and its posterior wall is deficient, and the muscle rests on its insertion on the fifth, sixth, and seventh costal cartilages. Second, we have the area between the costal margin and the arcuate line, which roughly lies here between the umbilicus and the symphysis pubis. So, in this region, we have classically anterior and posterior walls of rectus sheath. If we take a cross section like this, we will see the three flat muscles on the lateral side external oblique, internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis. And here we have the rectus abdominis muscle. Each of these three flat muscles terminate into a pilaminar aponeurosis. So we have pilaminar aponeurosis for external oblique, pilaminar aponeurosis for internal oblique, and pilaminar aponeurosis for transversus abdominis. So the anterior wall of the rectus sheath is trilaminated, made by the two laminae of the external oblique plus the anterior lamina of the internal oblique while its posterior wall is also trilaminated, made by the posterior lamina of the internal oblique and the pilaminar aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle. The third part of the rectus sheath is below the arcuate line, and as I said before, the main function of the infraumbilical part of the abdomen is to support the belly. So if we take a cross section here, the anterior wall of rectus sheath is made by the bilaminar aponeurosis of both external oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis, while posteriorly the rectus sheath is made only by the fascia transversalis, which covers the posterior aspect of the rectus abdominis below the level of the arcuate line. Another aponeurotic component of the anterior abdominal wall is the linea alba. It is a midline fibrotendinous rare, wider above than below, but widest in the umbilical region. It is stretched between the zephyoid process and the symphysis pubis. It is made, it is formed by the decussating upon neurotic fibers of the lateral muscles in either a single or triple decussation. The posterior surface of the linea alba in the epigastric region receives diaphragmatic sternocostal aponeurosis or extension from the sternocostal origin of the diaphragm and the significance of this aponeurotic extension is to synchronize the movement of the epigastric aponeurosis with that of the diaphragm during respiration. In another view here we can see the aponeurotic extension of the sternocostal origin of the diaphragm. We can see the decussating fibers at the linea alba and we can also see the fibrous a tendinous intersection of the rectus abdominis muscle. So if there is sudden contraction of the muscles of the abdomen, as in coughing, this will attack the aponeurotic fibers in their weakest point and this could predispose to tearing and later on hernia formation. Also, a vertical midline incision in the linea alba, especially in the epigastric region, will interrupt and abolish all digastric and expansile mechanisms of the abdominal wall and this predisposes to incisional hernia. We also need to know that there is different orientation of the collagenous fibers of the linea alba at both craniopodal and ventrodorsal directions. So in this cross section we can see that the ventral aspect of the linea alba contains like five or six rows of obliquely arranged collagenous uh, fibers while dorsally we have Again, five to six rows of transversely arranged collagen fibers covered by invariably irregular uh, collagen fibers. These collagen fibers intermingle with elastic fibers, which ensure recoil of the linea alba after its stretching. This architecture of the linea alba will lead to an anisotropic mechanical behavior. This is the neutral position of the linea alba we can notice that its fibers run in an oblique way. So if there is transverse pull or transverse stretching applied on the linea alba, it will get broader and uh, shorter because the oblique muscle fibers will get a more transverse orientation. While if there is vertical 
pull or vertical stretching of the linea alba as an increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. The fibers will be more oblique, leading to narrowing and elongation of the linea alba. That's why in patients with chronic distension or chronic increase in the intra-abdominal pressure, there will be downward displacement of the umbilicus. So, in the epigastric zone of the linea alba, there will be more compliance in a vertical direction than in the transverse direction. While in the umbilical zone, there will be more compliance in the transverse direction than in the vertical direction. That's why chronic increase in the intra-abdominal pressure, as in multiple pregnancies, will apply a force over the umbilical region, and this uh, will lead to stretching of the aponeurotic fibers in both transverse and vertical direction, and this will predispose to formation of umbilical and paraumbilical hernias. In the hypogastric zone of the linea alba, because of the approximation and the even overlap of the rectus abdominis muscles, the linea alba is thin, narrow, and made of single decussation. People with single decussation at the linea alba are more prone to midline herniation and failure following repair because simply the stitches will slip off. While triple decussation, especially in the epigastric zone, reinforces the aponeurotic texture and somehow protects the midline decussation from developing a midline hernia. So if there is hernia at this region, it would be at one side of the midline, not in the midline. If we compare the human to the quadrupeds, the quadrupeds are less prone to develop aponeurotic hernias as compared to a man because their linea alba is made of many lines of decussation to withstand the weight of the viscera that lie over the linea alba all the time in those animals. Uh, the external oblique, as we can see in this diagram, has a muscle fiber uh, which is directed downward and medially. Then at the line that extends from the tip of the ninth costal cartilage above and the anterior superior iliac spine below, the muscle fiber transform into a bilaminar aponeurosis, superficial layer and deep layer. The deep layer of the aponeurosis are in direct continuation with the external oblique fleshy bundle, so they are also directed downward and medially. They make either a single decussation at the midline or triple decussation, one in the midline and one on each side of the midline. So we can see in these pictures the rectus abdominis and this is the anterior wall of the rectus sheath. This line represents the superficial layer of the external oblique. This line represents the deep layer of the external oblique upon neurosis and this one represents the anterior lamina of the internal oblique aponeurosis. So the deep uh, layer of the external oblique aponeurosis after crossing the midline, some of its fibers form the superficial layer of the opposite external oblique, while the other fibers become continuous with the uh, anterior lamina of the internal oblique. For the internal oblique muscle, we can see that it is fan shaped at the line which is known as the linea semilunaris, which extends from the tip of the ninth costal cartilage till the pubic tubercle and roughly represents the lateral border of the rectus abdominis, transform into bilaminar aponeurosis, anterior layer and posterior layer. The behavior of these layers change from one region to the other in the anterior abdominal wall. So from the costal margin to the umbilicus, uh, the internal oblique upon neurosis splits into anterior lamina and posterior lamina. Each one pass in front of the rectus abdominis or just behind it. And then they cross in the midline and the fibers here carry on with the external oblique of the opposite side in front of the rectus abdominis or with the lamina of the transverses abdominis deep to the rectus abdominis of the opposite side. The second place from the level of the umbilicus to the iliac crest. So here we can see a different behavior of the laminae of the internal oblique. So the anterior lamina cross or decussate with the external oblique lamina 
nearly at the middle of the rectus abdominis and then pass superficial to the external oblique then cross again at the midline to become continuous with the external oblique of the opposite side while the posterior lamina make a crossing or decustation at the lateral border of the rectus abdominis then pass deep to the transversus abdominis upon neurosis then cross again at the midline to become continuous with the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis of the opposite side. The third location, from the level of the iliac crest downwards, we can notice that the internal oblique aponeurosis just pass in front of the rectus abdominis, deep to the external oblique and superficial to the transversus abdominis. And then its aponeurosis cross the midline to become continuous with the external oblique, and transversus abdominis of the opposite sides. So, as we can see here in this uh, picture, this is the internal oblique. It splits into two lamina, anterior and posterior. The anterior lamina communicate with the external oblique of the opposite side after crossing the midline, and the posterior lamina, after crossing the midline, communicates with the transversus abdominis of the opposite side. Thus, the internal oblique serve as an anchor point on the iliac bone to opposite external oblique and transversus abdominis to ensure stability of the tongue in the upright posture and also to ensure the approximation of the two iliac bones together and the stabilization of the sacroiliac joint as well. Next, we'll talk about the transversus abdominis. Its fibers either run horizontally or in upward and medial direction or downward and medial direction. Between the linea semilunaris and the lateral border of the rectus abdominis, the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis together with that of the internal oblique make a fascia called the spigelian fascia. It is somehow weak and herniation could develop in this region, especially below the level of the umbilicus. We call it the spigelian hernia. Since the transversus abdominis is the deepest muscle of the lateral uh, muscles of the anterior abdominal wall, this is their best mechanical position to act as circular compressor of the thoracic outlet and the abdominal cavity as well. Below the level of the arcuate line, its fibers pass anterior to the rectus abdominis to resist the pressure created by the downward descent of the diaphragm and the anterior abdominal wall muscles during respiration. So, the arcuate line represents the lower limit of the upper fibers of the transversus abdominis, which is more energetic and contractile than that of its lower part. So to summarize, we know by now that the external oblique of one side communicates with the external oblique of the opposite side. Also, the transversus abdominis of one side communicates with the transversus abdominis of the other side, while the internal oblique communicates with both external oblique and transversus abdominis of the opposite side. This digastric muscle pattern ensures the harmonized function of the anterior abdominal wall so forces can be transmitted from one side to the other through this digastric communication the other factors that help in supporting the anterior abdominal wall is the perpendicular crossing of the fibers of the adjacent aponeurotic layers so we can see that this layer is perpendicular over the layer deep to it the trilaminar plywood arrangement of the walls of the rectus sheath, the triple decussation that occurs at the linea alba, the triple crisscross decussation which can be seen in both the anterior wall and the posterior walls of the rectus sheath, but more in the posterior wall, and this is logic because the posterior wall is the first defensive mechanism against formation of hernia. For the umbilical region, let's see first this diagram which indicates the umbilical region at the fetus this is the anterior abdominal wall and this is the attached umbilical cord what concerns us uh, here is that we have two umbilical arches 
they lie on each side of the urinary bladder. Its apex is attached to the urecus, which passes uh, inside the umbilical cord. We also have the umbilical vein, which will pass at the free lower border of the falciform ligament in its way to the liver. After birth and falling of the umbilical cord, the umbilical ring is formed. It is a fibrous cicatrix that represents the area of fusion between the median umbilical ligament or the obliterated urecus and the two medial umbilical ligaments or the obliterated umbilical arteries. The round ligament of the liver, which is the obliterated umbilical vein, traverses the umbilical ring and passes superiorly within the falciform ligament on its way to the liver. For the anatomical variations, which is present in the umbilical ring region, in about 74% of the population, we can notice that the round ligament of the liver is continuous with the urecus and is attached to the lower border of the umbilical ring. In about 24% of the population, both the round ligament of the liver and the urecus splits into two branches to be attached to the upper border of the umbilical ring and the lower border of the umbilical ring making two triangles and this arrangement could be linked to the supra and infra umbilical hernias. In less than 1% of the population, the round ligament of the liver splits into two branches, each is continuous with the medial umbilical ligament and has no attachment to the umbilical ring. For the umbilical fascia, if we look at this diagram, this is a longitudinal section of the anterior abdominal wall showing the umbilical ring region, and we can see the layers forming the anterior abdominal wall at this region. So we have here the skin, the subcutaneous fat, the linea alpha, the median umbilical ligament and the round ligament of the liver, the fascia transversalis, which thickens behind the umbilical ring to form the umbilical fascia, and behind it lies the peritoneum. So the umbilical fascia is a thin fascia layer that extends between the medial umbilical ligaments. It extends inferiorly to become continuous with the visceral fascia enclosing the urinary bladder. It has many anatomical variations, so it either completely covers and supports the umbilical ring from behind, or only covers its upper part, or its lower part, or in some cases it lies away from the umbilical ring and this is probably associated with umbilical hernia. This would be the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. If you liked it, please do not forget to subscribe, like and share and do not forget to hit the notification bell so you can know if I upload another video. Please feel free to leave a comment below. See you in the next video. Thank you.